Hi, I'm Christopher Wilson, Director of Experience Design at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Welcome to a History Film Forum discussion of the 2021 film, My Name is Polly Murray. This film is a look at the life and ideas of Polly Murray, a non-binary Black activist, lawyer, poet, and priest who influenced both Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Thurgood Marshall. We began History Film Forum with the understanding that while, while millions of people visit the Smithsonian and other museums each year, many more people learn history on the screen. So we felt it important to look at film as public history, as a vehicle for interpreting and presenting history that reaches so many people. This film is a great example of a story that will introduce multitudes of people to a fascinating and important character from our past and a person who is unfamiliar to most of us, but who more of us should know. I'd like now to welcome the film's directors, Julie Cohen and Betsy West, and our moderator for this discussion, Faith Davis Ruffins, curator at the National Museum of, Hi of American History at the Smithsonian Institution. Welcome, Hello. Julie Cohen and Betsy West. Nice to see you. So nice to see you too. Nice to see you, Faith. Tell us a little bit about Polly Murray and how you found this film, because she's not well known to the average person in the public, even someone who thinks they know a lot about the modern civil rights movement. So could you tell us a little bit about her? Yeah, I mean, Polly Murray was an activist, a lawyer, someone who had a profound impact on both Thurgood Marshall and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a poet, uh, a, a, a professor, and uh, a non-binary person who, as you say, was not sufficiently recognized in a lifetime. Uh, and Julie and I found out more about Polly Murray from Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That was sort of our entry into Polly's story. That's right. I mean, you know, we also um, were unfamiliar with, uh, with Polly Murray and, and Polly's story um, even though, you know, thought we knew something about 20th century American history, you kind of felt like you'd learned it in school. We became familiar with Murray's story when we were making, uh, to, towards the end of the process of making our film RBG about Justice Ginsburg, when we saw from, you know, during our research process that, um, RBG had put Polly Murray's name on the cover as a co-author of the first brief that um, Ginsburg wrote before the U.S. Supreme Court, making the argument that gender equality is assured by the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The reason RBG put Polly Murray's name on the brief is because that idea really came from, from what was something that Polly Murray had developed uh, a full six years earlier, both in a law review article and in a federal court case uh, brief that, that Polly had written. Um, that's kind of what began our journey of researching this extraordinary figure, being blown away not only by Murray's accomplishment, but by the fact that we hadn't learned about them in school. Excuse me. Yes, Polly Murray was an extraordinary person. I happened to meet her when I was a freshman in college. Um, I was um, at Radcliffe College and they were organizing a, a symposium on black women artists and writers. She had been invited because of her book, Proud Shoes, which is the story of her family. And because she was a poet, she'd written a number of uh, pieces of poetry that often spoke very directly to the, to the issues of black Americans and their uh, struggle for civil rights. And of course, this was in 1973, and when the term black was being used by a lot of young people as a result of the uh, modern civil rights movement and the black power movement. So this uh, symposium was about black artists and their writing. And um, she was one of the invited uh, guests, one of the major people, Alice Walker and other people of her, of her uh, stature had been invited to this conference and um, she was very upset because we were using the word black rather than the term Negro, which was more typical of her generation. And in the film, some of her students, former students at Brandeis talk about how this was a conflict between the two generations. Yeah. Uh, the people who were the, at that time, young people in college, now the elderly baby boomers and <laughs> the people who were in her generation who had lived through and fought World War II 
And, you know, she, she was very adamant that they had worked so hard to get the term Negro capitalized and that this was the struggle of their generation and how could we leave this out? And she was a very, she seemed to me to be a very um, uh, feisty and kind of curmudgeonly uh, uh, elderly woman. Of course, she was probably only 60 then, but I thought, you know, she was very elderly. And um, she adamantly said this over and over, if you don't, you know, add Negro, I won't come. And they didn't add Negro and she didn't come. Wow. So um, this was quite an That's... introduction. That was why I knew the name Polly Murray, uh, uh, maybe before some other people. And that was, that, that was just a fascinating experience to have as a young person with someone who had fought so hard for so long, but had been so unrecognized. Yeah. I mean, Polly was so far ahead of the time, refusing to sit in the back of the bus in 1940 and working to desegregate restaurants uh, in Washington in, you know, the early 1940s, you know, decades before the modern civil rights movement that we all know about. Here's a person who'd been on the forefront and yet in the 1970s, as, as you recall, Polly did sort of come, come to, to blows a little bit with students who wanted to say black and Polly felt that uh, Polly and others had worked so hard to capitalize Negro and that this was a, a proud word. And But the interesting thing about those Brandeis students, those aging boomers, <laughs> they talked about how they came to see Polly as a mentor and to understand the role that Polly had played in history. I mean, one of them says Polly was walking history yeah. and they had this wonderful uh, relationship that uh, we found one of the more moving parts of the film was in talking to them and their experience in, in dealing with, as you say, a feisty opinionated person um, who had played such an incredible role in, in American history. It's a fascinating um, story. She, she apparently was really an unusual person uh, from, from childhood. I was astonished to discover that she had ridden the rails, the trains, as a young woman, kind of dressed as a young boy, but had ridden the rails, uh, uh, the trains, with um, basically kind of like hobos in the 1930s. This is an extraordinary uh, aspect of the film. Could you comment on that? Yeah, you know, we really loved uh, the story that Polly liked to tell and wrote about um, of, you know, it's 1933. Polly has just graduated from Hunter College. Um, you know, now living in New York, college educated, eager to find a job. You know, 1933 <laughs> was a very difficult time for most Americans to find a job, particularly an African-American woman. Um, the amazing thing is that Polly sort of views that in, in retrospect was viewing that as an opportunity. Like, well, this did give me a chance for this amazing adventure of riding the rails. And Polly is not only spends uh, a few weeks going, you know, crawling on boxcars of trains and uh, going, going around the country, but also makes a very unusual choice for 1933 to document that journey, taking photos of things seen along the way and even handing off a camera for a fellow rail rider to take a picture of Polly crawling up the side of a, a boxcar, an extraordinary photo that I, we, we felt like really gives the viewer a deep sense of the sense of adventure that Polly felt like this is someone who's actually enjoying this uh, so somewhat dangerous and, and, and scary journey, but, but seeing it as a, as a chance to see America. Like it just shows what an incredible person this was in a, in a whole lot of different ways. I think one of the aspects uh, that probably made her underknown earlier in her life has to do with the fact that today we would say she was a non-binary person. I think maybe some of the reason why a film could get made now is because we have a much wider sense of the LGBTQ plus communities and that she was a member of and participated in as an individual and with her, with her friends, her cohort, but maybe was not part of an active movement at that time. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, 
there really wasn't a movement uh, per se. And, and we have, uh, we learned and others have learned about Polly being a non-binary person from the private letters that Polly was writing mainly in the, you know, the late thirties, the early forties, Polly's uh, saying to doctors, look, uh, people think I'm a woman, but I really think I'm a man. And, um, you know, this was a struggle that was a, a lonely and private struggle for a person who didn't have a wider community. I'm not saying there weren't other people out there, but they weren't connected. And, um, you know, it's pretty brave of Polly to even make these inquiries to doctors and say, oh, I've read that in Europe, they're using testosterone to help make men more masculine. Maybe that would help me. And the doctors are completely rejecting Polly as if Polly's crazy, like, sorry. I mean, this was a lonely struggle, uh, but one which I, I think you're right that now we have more understanding and perhaps that has opened people up to learning the story of Polly Murray above and beyond Polly's accomplishments, which are many in you know the legal and activism career, but also a person who was probably held back and could have done even greater things uh, had this not been a, a struggle. I think it was very, um excuse me, emotionally moving to discover that later in life, she does have um, a very close, warm, seemingly spousal relationship with, with another woman whom she calls Rennie, I think. Right, I mean, on that. Uh, pa Polly absolutely, you know, found a life partner um, in an environment at a time when that really was not easy. Um, at the Paul Weiss, the New York corporate law firm where Polly worked as an associate in the, 19, the late 1950s, the office manager was a woman named Rini Barlow, um, a white woman from England. Uh, Polly and Rini uh, fell in love through their shared Episcopal faith. That's kind of what brought them together and stayed together for 15 years, not living together technically, although certainly spending, you know, months at a time at one another's, uh, in one another's homes. Um, when Irene's mother fell ill, Polly was very much involved in her care. I mean, this was, you know, and when you read the letters between them, the intimacy and that, you know, th th this was, and certainly akin to a marriage and in a different era when such things would have been possible and, and legal, most likely um, would have been a marriage and brought Polly by all accounts a great deal of solace, so much so that when Irene died uh, young, that led to a crisis of faith for Polly, which is ultimately what led to the unusual turn in a lot of people's eyes to go to the seminary and study for the Episcopal priesthood. It's quite striking, you know, very, very few women were admitted to uh, 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 Ivy League law schools at the time that she was. Uh, she does get a law degree from Yale University um, and, and later returns actually to get a PhD, uh, a doctor of laws, but, which is really quite extraordinary. But perhaps even more unusual than that was her, her um, re-experiencing of her Episcopal faith, and this led her eventually to become the first Black woman Episcopal priest. That's quite extraordinary and, and certainly would only have been possible as the Episcopal Church had changed over time. Uh, any thoughts on that, Paul? Yeah. yeah. I mean, once again, Polly entered seminary at a time when Episcopals were not ordaining uh, you know, women, people identified as women as priests. So uh, it was sort of a leap of faith by the time Polly uh, got out of seminary and Polly was involved in the movement to push the Episcopal Church to allow the ordination of women and, and became the first uh, female identified African American uh, uh, ordained as an Episcopal priest. I mean, I, it's interesting because Polly had gone toward the law you know, had moved toward the law and actually gotten first degree from Howard University uh, because uh, Polly felt that 
they needed the law to help fight the battles that were so obvious uh, uh, there, and then got this further degree at Yale, the, as you said, the, uh, the doctorate at Yale, um, in a career where Polly was making all these incredible sort of legal insights and, ha and, and contributions to both civil rights and women's rights. But in turning to the priesthood, that was a big shift toward a more spiritual existence and a, diff a difference in Polly uh, thinking that maybe I've made my contributions to the law and now I'm going to move on to a religious era, which did surprise many of, of Polly's friends, uh, but seemed to give Polly a lot of comfort. And, you know, the interview that we did with Polly's uh, niece, grandniece showed us how how Polly changed in a way. We loved how uh, Karen Rouse Ross talked about, you know, you talked about the feisty personality. You know, Polly was a talker and mm, yeah. Polly became more of a listener. And then of course, gave time for Polly to write their extraordinary autobiography to put down on paper this amazing life story. Uh, yes, thank you for correcting me. I had, um temporarily forgotten that her, her law degree, original law degree, was from Howard University, where she went because that was the center of the struggle yeah. for civil rights. And many, many lawyers were trained there, right. uh, specifically, uh, uh, who come to work for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And she is one of, she's one of those lawyers who's trained there yeah. and later goes to Yale after her other extraordinary journey when she decides to go to Ghana the first independent <laughs> sub-Saharan uh, African uh, country, the first to, to become independent after colonialism. So she is there at the uh, sort of dawn of uh, Ghana as an independent country. Very unusual, again, for a woman alone to go uh, teach in Ghana. And uh, she apparently has some interesting experiences there, but discovers, as she says in the film, that she is an American, that, that, she, that um, Ghana is not her home, that the United States is her home, and that African-Americans have fought and died and, and bled and worked for this country. And therefore, that is, this is really their country. And after about 18 months with a somewhat run-in, perhaps with potentially, with the um, um, soon to be a little repressive government of Ghana, she returns to the United States. And that's when she goes to Yale. Absolutely. You know, Polly's whole life, if you look at it from a distance in a way, is kind of like a struggle to find a place. And a lot of Polly's unusual career moves can be seen in that light. You know, there Polly is in New York at a big law firm making a really nice salary for really the first time. Mm -hmm. And um, the crisis of, of faith caused by, you know, a 1959 horrendous lynching uh, leads Polly to feel like I'm kind of done with America. I can't, I can't be here anymore. Has the uh, rare opportunity to be one of the part of starting up uh, right. Ghana's uh, f first law school and teach con teaching kind of American constitutional principles in Ghana, um, going to Africa for the first time, having an amazing experience trying to connect with um with the african ancestors and and yet and and, and some uh Ghanaian law school law students with whom Polly formed mentoring relationships um that were common uh, a common thread for Polly and then you know it turns out that uh some elements within uh the leadership of Ghana were not crazy about somebody teaching the principles <laughs> of democratic freedom to the young the young students of Ghana. Uh, Polly realizes, oh, actually, my life might be in danger um, and cer certainly my freedom. And that, you know, there happens to be another great opportunity to get this doctorate at Yale Law School. So and, and Polly realizes, like, you know, I, I went away because I was so disheartened with everything that happened in America, but actually I am an American. America's my home and that's where I wanna go back and continue my fight. So what do, you, what do you want people to take away from this film? What do you think her legacy is? Well, first of all, to recognize the contributions that Polly made to 
legal thinking in this country that you know led to advances in civil rights and in gender equality. I think you know Polly has to be firmly placed, and um, it feels we like people to take away that understanding, and we hope that maybe Polly Murray will be a name that high school students will learn and college students will learn. And I think, you know, we're not the only ones talking about this, obviously. I mean, there's, um, uh, you've known about Polly Murray, many uh, uh, historians, especially, yeah. uh, you know, African American mm -hmm. women have been talking about Polly Murray for a long time, but it does feel like maybe there is a movement now that people will recognize Polly's importance. And, you know, there's sort of a larger issue of looking at our history and reconsidering how we teach history, not just Polly Murray, but all of the people who made contributions uh, in the past who've not been recognized. Um, so I guess that's, that's, you know, maybe the main point. And I think also it's just to me, it was, it's thrilling to think about this life, as you say, starting from riding the rails, every <laughs> single decision that Pauly made, uh, sometimes contrary to what a lot of people would have done. I mean, here is a person who led an extraordinary adventuresome life. And I hope people will just enjoy reading about Pauly's story, or I mean, seeing, watching, experiencing with the help of all the archive that Pauly left behind, the audio tapes, the video. I mean, we get to hear Pauly's voice, we get to see Pauly, yes. and to really experience what this person was like, what drove Pauly Murray. Yes, it's important to note that that um, uh, uh, despite her um, contra trumps with the, with the uh, people during the conference, she did leave her papers to the Schlesinger Library, which is currently at Harvard University and is a library devoted uh, to the history of women and gender in the United States. So uh, I think you said there are 150 boxes of uh, uh, archival materials and videotapes. It was extraordinary that she were able to put her actual voice in this film and her and her her, her that, that she you could see her and you could see hear her speaking in her own voice, which is not always true about, uh, you know, when you're working on someone who's no longer alive. Absolutely, and that's 100% because of Polly's own decision to collect and keep and put in a place where it would be accessible, an archive of materials. Um, many scholars who've come before us, including our consulting producer on this film, Patricia Bell Scott, have accessed and read more words in that archive than we have but um the listening through to all of the audio tapes and then finding some additional videotapes was a, a really new experience and really what allowed us to to make documentary about Polly's life and that's that's what Polly had in mind you know a lot of these were either oral histories that were done about Polly in the 1970s mostly or some journalist interviews, and a journalist would show up at Polly's home. Polly would pull out another tape recorder and and hit oh. hit record and save the tape. Like you know, not most most people don't most do historical that. figures, let alone most <laughs> most ordinary people, are not doing that. But Polly had the wherewithal to understand that, like getting getting it all down and saving it and making sure that it got to to Radcliffe. Um, and remember that Har Harvard is another one of the institutions that had rejected Pauli. Um, UBC had rejected Pauli on account of race, and Harvard had a uh, ha Harvard Law School had rejected Pauli very clearly on account of gender. Just saying, sorry, we see that you're you're Miss Pauli Murray. That's not uh, <laughs> you're you're out. So perhaps I mean actually. Uh, Polly's grandniece speculated that maybe it was meant as a little poke at, at Harvard to, uh, to put the collection there. And we, we'll never know for sure, but we kind of like that idea. Well, I think she really comes across as a person who is uh, really committed to telling her own story and making sure that her version of her story is recorded and, and, and is present, because I think she must have thought that later, perhaps after her death, but later, people would come to a better understanding of her and see in her life um, um, a possibility that maybe her contemporaries didn't even see. Yeah, I think 
Polly did believe that. And it, it was heartening to us when, when we were at uh, Schlesinger Library, one of the curators said to us, and as you said, Schlesinger Library is a repository of, of collections from many, many famous American women. When you're walking through the, the stacks, I mean, you can see Betty Friedan and you can see, you know, letters of Lucretia Mott and all kinds of- Julia Child. Of, Julia Child, yes. <laughs> many, many women are represented there. And yet the Polly Murray collection, according to this curator, is one of the most requested now by oh. students at, at Harvard which oh, I wow. think is a reflection of the kind of discovery of, of Polly Murray. Uh, and, you know, that's, that was heartening to us. Absolutely, she's, she's an extraordinary figure and thank you so much for bringing her uh, to life for a new generation. Thank you, Faith, and to our guests, Julie Cohen and Betsy West for this discussion today. My name is Polly Murray is available to stream on Amazon beginning October 1st, 2021. I want to thank Amazon Studios and to our partners at Smithsonian Associates for this program, as well as to Dan Minad and Democracy Films for, uh, whose support makes History Film Forum programs possible. Thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to convening to explore history on the screen with you in other History Film Forum programs.